Right, thank you so much. If I may just repeat what Mary said to thank you all for taking the trouble to come here this afternoon. What she didn't say because of the two year gap in between, I have an email from September 2019 arranging a date for today's talk. The library have now stopped sending their employees for training at the DVLA. That's your driving license, if anybody doesn't know. And heck of a time before you get your license back. Again, as far as the smoking is concerned, or the fire regs, so it's no sneaky, you know, and putting your fag out underneath the seat like you used to do in the cinema when you were, shall we say, younger, on the back row or whatever. Anyway, also I really would like to welcome Mrs. Sheila Watley, who's here today. She's the great-granddaughter of James Hargreaves, uh, the sister of my boss, Michael Hargreaves. So she's come all the way from Yorkshire. They've allowed her in to come to this talk today. And she's helped considerably, obviously, with various things uh, over time. Right, excuse me, I need to get the, this little fancy thing. As I say often enough, in my day, I had a slate. I still have my primary school slate. And you're suddenly on with things like this and projections and whiteboards. Uh, again, while we're on the thanks, there's just so many people to thank. I hope I haven't missed anybody out. Uh, it did all start with Harriet Roberts when I was, um, in fact, that was the first time I met Ray Smith. I know Paddy, who did the first talk, never met Ray. He, he knew of him, but hadn't actually met him. His talk, incidentally, on horses would have loved James Hargreaves. He loved his horses. He had several horses, went on the pendle hunt. Um, Anytime you see a talk headed up by Paddy Brown, do make sure you go there. Um, anyway, I was a volunteer at the Child Action Northwest or Blackburn Orphanage uh, when Harriet got a grant in 2014. They, they found the original records of James Dixon, who formed the orphanage there. And um, that's when I met Ray. So I knew him what, four or five years before, sadly, he passed on. He did read some of the early diaries and he was thrilled to bits and he said, Eric, you must continue with these. And when we got the final transcription a year or two back, uh, well, no, more than that, he said, I don't want to read them now, Eric, I want to wait until they're all together. Sadly, he never did live to see that, although I'm sure he's watching today in, in the, up in the ether somewhere. <laughs> Uh, again, just a few thanks to uh, people who aren't here. The Vinny Solanke at the time was the museum curator, and he took a great interest. He said there's a lot of vital information in these diaries that we don't know about. He said we know the, shall we say, the working class to a certain extent in Blackburn, what they ate, what leisure they had, their work, everything like that. We know nothing really about the moneyed middle class, which is what James Hargreaves and his cronies or worthies belong to. He used one of his volunteers, Molly Manthorpe, and she actually personally did the first five or six diaries. Then there was slight health problems, and she moved down south to live with her son. Uh, again, through Harriet Roberts, she put me in touch with what was then called NADFAS, they now call the Art Society, much simpler, thankfully. And they took over transcribing, I think 14 of them, I know there's a couple here today, did that job, again, over about two years. Labour of love. Thank you for them, too. Uh, I see another friendly face there in Ken Ford. He kindly helped me set up my first PowerPoint presentation when we did a mini one a few years ago for the Art Society. Uh, I'm learning as I go along uh, on what Ken told me and what my grandson tells me. Uh, anyway, let, let's, let's move on, if I can get the right one. Uh, as I say, when, I, when we were in the cellars at the orphanage, I suddenly came across mention of a Jas Hargreaves as one of the trustees of the orphanage. And that, I thought, that's interesting, because my chairman, Mr. Roger, and we called him by the Christian name, Mr. Roger, Mr. Michael Hargreaves, you know, you didn't say. Uh, and then later on, it said James Hargreaves, tobacconist. So I knew it was the same one whose company I work for. So that sort of started the whole process uh, that finds us here today. I'll turn over the page. 
Uh, James was also a friend of Nancy Derbyshire, who you may or might, may not know, was a great benefactor to Blackburn. Uh, he was a friend and sort of financial advisor. So he advised uh, to buy the land on which the orphanage was built at Wiltshire, around the corner from where I live. He also um, um, advised, uh, again, to sort of buy stained glass windows for the St. Silas Church, which they both attended. And, of course, Nancy Derbyshire eventually built the almshouses, the famous almshouses in Blackburn, which are really quite something, uh, even uh, bettering, shall we say, some that were built much later on. And he was often asked to advise, uh, I think Bolton were putting one up, and they came to talk to James to see how to go about it. So those are James, very, I don't know what you call him, very imperious, very businessman, very businesslike. He lived in several houses, um, and again he was co-founder of Blackburn High School for Girls. Now in those days, for goodness sake, you didn't dare educate the girls, did you? You know, you had to smarten them up, see who would marry them, and hope that that chap had plenty of money behind him. But no, he and, uh, I've forgotten the name of the other chap, actually went about setting up the school in Blackburn, which obviously was quite ahead of its time in those days for educating uh, the distaff uh, side of our race. And his own daughter, his eldest daughter Jane, went there as well. And I often wonder, reading the diaries, whether he ever regretted that, because she was quite a staunch lady. And in the early days of me reading the diaries, um, he would say... Um, uh, went out with mother, and I thought he meant his mother. In fact, he was referring to his wife, Mary. And he said, I oh, went out with Jane, so I thought Jane was his wife. No, no, it was the elder daughter. So, years on, uh, after his wife sadly died in 1913, she was mistress of the house, and they would have a fair few rows, so much so that he once cleared off to Clitheroe to another daughter to escape her wrath. And then sort of got a meeting together, sorted it out, and said, this is my house. And there was some sort of peace thereafter. She was the last one to live at their fabulous house at Barcraft, incidentally. Uh, never married. Uh, this one, uh, we've lost a little bit on there. There were some sort of rings on there that Ken put. I don't know what's happened on that one. But that, that's the family that originated in uh, Wood Plumpton, Preston. Obviously good farming stock. You can see the top bar there, all the sons and daughters. Uh, James is the second born, uh, and there's an elder son, John. There appears to be some sort of friction be between those two. I I've never really found out exactly why. I think possibly James lent him money, because he was classed as an Italian warehouseman in Wallasey, and it seems he owes money. It's never specifically said, but it I know the, the nephew comes to visit James to sort of plead for his dad, and James sends him packing. And at one stage, he visits his, son, his brother John, and John says, for goodness sake, choose some paintings. So he actually takes some oil paintings, presumably valuable ones, as part of this debt, whatever it is. Uh, oh, I see you've got the click. Oh, that's clever. Yes, there's James, sorry. Thomas, that's his dad. Another Thomas. Uh, Roger B. Hargreaves, that's the father of uh, Sheila at the back there. And then Michael. You keep seeing the R, that stands for Ray, which is his wife, Mary Bennett, or B, and an R keeps cropping up in the names. Uh, there's a beautiful pair of miniature portraits of James and wife Mary. Uh, you don't see it quite so well in this light, but when you see them real, the quality of, say, the lace. Oh, sorry, I've gone that wrong there. Eh? Pressed the wrong button there. Oop. That's that one. Wait a minute. Oh, there we are. The quality of the lace there, you ladies will probably know more about that. Very, very fine lace. It's really quite something. And he has some sort of collar or cravat there. The lady's name is called Fanny Way, who was a relatively famous miniature portrait painter of the time. Uh, his sons and daughters um, paid for those uh, as a gift to him. Now this is when he... Sorry, I'll just go back a wee bit. 
as to when he first started the diaries. The first diary we have is 1894. His company is well established. His three sons, or three of his sons, are in the business. Another one is training to be a solicitor. And he decides to do the grand tour with Cooks. Uh, initially, I thought he went with his wife, Mary, but he didn't. He went on his own. So the very first, so that's when he starts the diaries, uh, 20, over a 25-year period. Sadly, we're two missing, but anyway. So I'll just read this first one. February the 5th, 1894. Started for London, en route for Switzerland, Italy, Egypt, Palestine, Greece. Not bad, it's not, ju not just your... Uh, <laughs> uh, where is it? Uh, Spain or wherever. Stayed at St Pancras Hotel with Mr Wilson and Messrs Bert Whistle, Senior and Junior. Went to theatre at night, a life of pleasure, which we all enjoyed very much. He was a keen theatre goer as well and uh, singing music societies here in Blackburn and elsewhere. He would go to London, Manchester, wherever, and see a lot of plays and theatre. So that started the, the night. He was away for eight weeks on his own, on his own. And in fact, he got quite emotional and sad on the day of his birthday. He'd got a card from his wife and he actually puts in his diary, he wept thinking of her. So for a hard businessman, there's not an awful lot of, shall we say, emotion in, in the diary, which you wouldn't do in those days anyway. But every now and then there'd be this little, little bit that obviously got right to the core of how he, he, he loved Mary. Um, but he said he wrote to her that day and felt better by the time he went to bed. <laughs> so, fellas, if, you, you know, if you're missing your partner, your wife, or you've had a row, whatever, write a little note to her at the end of the day. Okay. So this is his first shop. Apparently, um, and Mr. Roger told me this, he, it was almost a case of his dad saying one day, here you are, son, there's a, a nice new coat or jacket for you. Slipped a guinea in his top pocket. Away you go and make your way in the world. Obviously, all those sort of children, you know, there'd be probably no room for him on the farm, or maybe he didn't want to work on the farm. So he went, I think, at first working for a tobacconist in Preston. And he found that as he went round the customers, there was often complaints about the quality of the pipe tobacco. Those days, it was more pipes and snuff than cigarettes. And he'd come and do a repeat order, oh, that last lot of St. Bruno Flake was rubbish. So that got him the idea. So he went up to the places like Glasgow, Edinburgh, Newcastle, where Sinclair's and people like that mixed tobacco, pipe tobacco, and said, right, I'm going to set my own company up and I'm going to buy from you, but if I find the quality is below par, you pay for it to be returned and you replace it. And that's how he made his business, that's how he got his renown for the best quality pipe tobacco. He came to Blackburn and set up um, Higher Church Street, um, that's in the times of 1862, 19th. Uh, of July. Uh, yeah, it's now a nail bar, actually. <laughs> but next door it says Smoker's World, and that's v vaping stuff, so what do you think of vaping? I don't know. Uh, that, that's the place now. You know, possibly just next, next to Lloyd's Bank there, and that's Smoker's World. Now, there, and I have it here somewhere. And Mr. Roger gave me that one day. He found out that I was sort of pretty interested in old stuff and I was saving stuff that I found lying about the place. His son, obviously, Michael, was too busy running the business. So one day he said, you might like this, Eric. And it's James's little pocket book, he calls it. And it starts on um, the 1st of November, 1883. And for a two-week period... Oh, hang on, that's a total, sorry. Got the weekly one. Average for 14 weeks, 950 pounds, 10 shillings. Now in today's money, I think that's about 120,000 pounds. And that's just in pipe tobacco and snuff. That's a heck of a lot of nicotine, isn't it? So there's his little entry and it goes on Right the way through, but the, he, he will get up to a thousand pounds averaging uh, over those weeks, which is, as I say, not bad going, is it? So no wonder he could expand. Right. Um, this is another great one, and I, 
this particular snuff box is in the museum. Now, Christine there sent me a nice picture literally overnight, and I, I put a copy up there at the side if I don't want to look at it. But um, James Hargreaves bought this snuff tin, which allowed him to have the brand and the, and the make. I estimated it's about 260 odd years old, I believe. It's got a little brass plate on Edmondson's there. And the tale was that the chaps who take snuff, and in the main it was the chaps, at weekend when the shops were shut, they were so desperate for a sniff of snuff, they would go up to the letterbox of the shop apparently. <laughs> yeah, absolutely true. Again, uh, Mr. Roger, or Uncle Roger, we sometimes refer to him as Uncle Roger told me about that one. Right. Um, incidentally, my, my parents had a corner shop in Audley Lane, and we used to have to weigh out snuff in those days. Very delicate, half an ounce of snuff. The old codgers would come in on a Friday night on the way to the working men's club or the pub, and they'd say, I want half an ounce of snuff, lad. And you used to be very careful weighing it out. It was quite fiddly, I can assure you. Um, that's mentioned when he moved to number 36, Kim William Street. That's when he really expanded. Very big shop. And in fact, they even named one, their own brand of cigarettes, number 36, um, because of the number of the street. So, but this is when he's really expanding. And this one, he, this is obviously the Boer War, 1900, he donates a pound of tobacco for each man as they set off for the Boer War. Um, then, as I say, it was mainly pipes, it was not cigarettes. Cigarettes really only came in, uh, if I'm, I'm correct, and I know Stephen will correct me here, cigarettes only came in, I think, in World War I. Uh, they were more easy to deal with than a pipe when you're in the trenches, obviously. James, incidentally, didn't think that packets of cigarettes would catch on, because they sold them by weight, and that taxation was on the weight of the tobacco, which happened for quite a while, even into my time. Uh, then in 1906, he, he then goes into a limited company. So he brings his... Uh, uh, there's James at Barcroft. This is his last fabulous house he buys. Uh, William Ray, that's his son. Thomas, James, uh, Mary, he's got his wife on. And then Jane, Jane, elder daughter. And I think he puts up or states there's £20,000 share issue which again is one heck of an amount, believe you me. Doesn't mean you actually pay that out, but if, if you went in debt, you would have to pay up to that sum of 20,000 pounds before you could go any. Interestingly, oh, my fat finger keeping on the wrong button. Oh, uh, the signature of the accountants, oops, I'm all over the place here. Oh, we are, it's Waterworths. And it's signed by Mr. Rudd. Now, any Blackburn people will know there's a firm, Waterworths, Rudd and Hare. I think they just go as the name of Waterworths now. They were our accountants right up to us uh, being taken over. So, interesting document. Uh, it's about 40 pages. I only found that online <laughs> about two weeks ago on the Palm and Harvey uh, line. They, they're the ones that bought the company out. Uh, there's one of our shops. Uh, I'm not too sure, what, that's obviously the famous booze one, everybody knew the booze and the booze cafe, and uh, that's one of the shops there. Not sure of that street, I need somebody to tell me what that street is. Um, now apparently the, the bosses, James and the boss of booze used to walk down to, sorry? I thought somebody was saying the street name there. Uh, used to walk down together in the morning, putting the world to right, and apparently they'd come and stand in front of the respective windows, checked the display, and then went inside. <laughs> and if I remember rightly, James liked his drink, whereas Mr. Booth was a teetotaler. So this is, the, as I say, goes on to the second shop. Uh, there's another one, which is King William Street. They said the one we talk about. Uh, the chap there, I'm almost certain, is a chap called Walt Wormsley. Uh, it's his stance, he sort of stood like this. And then they wore bowler hats, and the, the case he had is a sample case, and I've got one on the back there. And basically that would be, had little trays in, and you'd take sweeties round and offer them the shops, because they wouldn't quite know what, yes, the bars of chocolate, the ordinary sweets they would uh, 
need to have a good sample first. And I know a company, I think it was in Liverpool, made toffee, uh, I've just forgotten the name, like Highland toffee. And they had three sorts, the ordinary one, and they put butter and milk in it, really was nice. They had a fruit and nut one, and they had a, um, a licorice one. So there used to be little boxes about that size of samples. And you, so you kept in with Frank on the trade counter, because he'd give you these, because the reps didn't want to take them out anymore. Or travellers, as they were called then. So I'd say, I'm pretty certain that Walt, that's a picture of Walt there, he and a chap called Bert Cockshut started together straight from school at age 16 and retired together at age 65. So how's that for loyalty? Now that's the railway road one going on the way to the boulevard. Again, if you look, fantastic displays of maybe for, forbidden uh, narcotics these days. This again is taken in the shop. Uh, a lady got in touch via Mary here, who said my grandfather, I think it was, was a director of Hargreaves. Um, uh, Roberts, that's right. Now, there's the name there, John Gibson. His son was also in the business as well. When I first joined, John, John Gibson was just retiring as buyer, and Mike, Mike Watson followed him. Uh, and the other chap is... Uh, uh, Roberts, I think. Now, who are the other director is at the back there, climbing on the ladder? It's almost like a ghostly apparition. But it is, oh, the name is there, sorry, it is Lane, I think it is. So I think he drew the short straw. You're the one standing on the ladder as well, they take a photograph. But, uh, but again, you see the fabulous display of tobacco and snuff. Oh, oh there we are. too fast again, sorry. Go on. Uh, yeah, it's my fat fingers on the little delicate buttons, I'm afraid. You see all, all, all those uh, boxes of cigars. And these are Delft jars, which were made in Delft, especially for the company. And they'd have different types of tobacco in. Uh, Virginia tobacco. Uh, you need, I think it was called, it was a Russian tobacco. You're allowed to boo there. Very strong, very dark tobacco. And Hargreaves would mix them. And the various well-to-do would have their own personal mix for the pipe and come and collect it. Uh, one such um, customer was Major Adams from Horton Tower. And he'd come in on his motorbike, very military, park outside, double yellow lines, come in and get his own private mix and off he'd go again. Uh, these are the actual jars, unbelievable jars. They're quite big, they're about so big. Uh, only one actually with the name Hargreaves on, the Hargreaves mixture. Um, I actually rescued them. They're in the back garage when we moved. We had to move premises to Weir Street from just around the corner in Mincing Lane. And they were all over the place. Tin lids were damaged. I got a friend to solder the rims and touch them up with paint and whatever. Uh, according to Mr. Rogers, two or three got broken over the years. So there might well have been about 20 odd, uh, you know, over time. Uh, there again, you get the fantastic display at... King William Street. All right, all right. All right, where we go next? Uh, this is another brand name, uh, Bull Pups. They were like a medium sized cigar. And in fact, the box, they're wooden boxes. There's one at the back there. Um, I did have an earlier one that just said James Hargreaves, so it predates 1906 before the limited company. Now they're a limited company, and apparently Wills would supply their own brand, I'm not sure what it was called, in these wooden boxes. And James, being a bit naughty, you were supposed to send them back, and then Wills had refilled them and sent them out again. James kept them back and put his own label on top, and he got in a bit of trouble apparently for, not, <laughs> for using somebody else's. Uh, wooden box. Well, that was a brand name. That was another famous one. And again, if you look at the artwork on some of these, I have a book at the back called Cigarette Pack Art, and the colours and the design are just amazing. Just a shame. It's about an awful, what they call it, dreaded weed or whatever. Uh, that's another brand name, Hargreaves Mixture. That's the name of the shop. Uh, there's a package of cigarettes. I think there's one packet of it. Anybody who collects cigarette packets, that's got to be probably one of the rarest there is. Uh, again, we had our own snuff. And uh, it was Mr. Roger that told me he named it, or named the, the, the marketing thing. It was called Pendle Snuff. 
as sharp as a viper's tongue, he said. And he was rather proud. <laughs> Sheila smiling there. That, that's just what your dad would say, I think, doesn't it, Sheila? Uh, there's some letterheads and uh, uh, invoices. That's a wrapper. And again, you would tend to get cigarettes in boxes like that rather than your tens and twenties, as I was saying earlier. Um, and at Christmas, they would, might do overwraps, with, you know, with Christmas messages on, literally slide over. Uh, again, some are more of the, that was a famous one, Bees and Ben. A good question here. Everybody know what a Beesum is? A they are, yeah, you can tell you're some from Lancashire here, yeah, a brush. Uh, now then, these are some of the fancy goods that they also start selling, you know, fancy lighters, Art Deco. Uh, uh, I think that's a lighter at the bottom, the lady there. <laughs> Hope she doesn't burn her toes. Um, this is a smoking cabinet. Now, I only knew one of my four grandparents, uh, Grandma Nolan. Her uh, husband was a policeman across the way there. He, he was on the first picture, if you remember, PC-53. That's me in his uniform. But anyway, um, Grandma said, well, obviously, while she was alive, that when, I, when she was playing with woolly worms, that was mine. And she said that grandfather had, I don't know, put this... And I was a burglar and he kept offending. And thanks to grandfather, he was in jail a few times. But when he came out, grandfather uh, got him a job with a cabinet maker and joiner. <coughs> so as a thank you, he made that cabinet for the policeman to put him down several times. I still have it. It's a beautiful cabinet. And you keep your clay pipes in, as you can see. You might just seal... Oh. Right, me again. I've just noticed there's a picture of a little girl up there showing a lovely leg. That's my daughter, Suzanne, who's, <laughs> who's in the audience today. Uh, now then, the chair. This was made by Haywood Brothers, Chicago, as you can see, 1896. Uh, James headed up a, a, a trade delegation, Chamber of Trade from Blackburn, to go to the States. And he evidently saw that while he was over there and brought it back with him. Uh, so it's got to be about 110, 120 years old, that. When we were taken over, thankfully the Preston lot didn't want the chair, so I inherited it. It's in my dining room at home. It's a great big heavy thing, and you can swing back and feel like a sheriff, you know. Uh, really well-made oak. I've actually had to replace the, the moquette, I think they call it. It was totally worn away when I got it. But fortunately, Mother just recovered her settee and the old red moquette. I said, don't throw that away. And I still have another piece, and I took every brass uh, furniture stood out one by one and they're all brass clean them all up individually put them in my drill and you know, put some wire wool on it so it really does look fine uh, this was his house uh, on uh, no, I, no oh, oh we've missed hang on oh, it's, oh that one's come on first right Bartroff was his last house which was owned by um the town clerk of Blackburn, who moved to Leeds um, just before the end of one year, and he heard about it over Christmas, went to see it and bought it. I've just forgotten, maybe one of the art society correct. I think he bought it something like £1,200 plus £60 for the billiard table. Uh, beautiful big house, still there, uh, been extended. He was very proud of it, the rhododendrons, his garden, he had a tennis court. And his cronies would come, uh, doctors Aitken and Bannister, we'll hear about them a little bit later, would come and obviously play a game of billiards, have a good glass of port, and obviously a good cigar as well. So life was good. Uh, this is actually his previous house on Pressinger Road. Uh, it's been all done up at the moment. I'm not sure whether it's sort of flats. Now, again, some of us will well remember Fine, all over the place here. Round the side used to be the office where you went in to take your driving test. And you might remember that. And when he bought Barcroft, he was stuck with this and he didn't know what to do. And he said to his wife, well, all the carpets fit and a lot of the furniture fit. It's a shame to, you know, uproot them and put them in Barcroft. Tell you what, we'll leave most of the stuff in Mayfield and you go to Waring in Gillows in Manchester with Jane and buy some new stuff for Barcroft. And I let my son buy that. I think it was Thomas. 
but he's not struggling, but he paid him £600 to help him get a mortgage. And then he thought he'd better give the other son a bit of money as well, and he's not showing preference. So he gave the other son £500. So his son carried on living in, uh, in Mayfield. Uh, he, he had a, apparently excellent collection of paintings. Um, I know there's a gentleman here, Brian Healy, told me, yes, they're pretty good paintings, those, Eric. Pretty, pretty good artists. Uh, and he, he loaned them for yes, at Liverpool Art Gallery. Um, I'm not sure, there might well be one or two here in Blackburn in the museum. Sadly, they haven't got a, a full list of what they've got and where they came from. So there might well be some uh, of his paintings here in Blackburn still. Um, he was a member of the um, District Club. That was politically affiliated. You might know that the full title of the Conservative Party is Conservative and Unionist. So there'd be all, I think there were about four or five different clubs in Blackburn at the time. I know one was called the Turkey Club, believe it or not. I think they were the rural chaps coming in from the farms. And all the, the worthies of Blackburn, believe you me, are on there. And in their it was a centenary year, they hired the cartoonist Mel from London, from the London Gazette, to come up and do pen portraits of all the members. As I say, if you went along, you say, oh, that's Foster Yates and Toms, that's uh, Thwaites, that's uh, Medicross, all the businesses around, a lot of the businesses around Blackburn. Um, then they came back 10 years afterwards, and uh, who's here at the bottom we just joined? R.B. Hargreaves, looking very suave. Uh, that's uh, Dot Aitking up there, see? Uh, one of his buddies, as I referred to there. Um, right, let's just see, I haven't missed anything too important. Mm -hmm. Then he, his wife sadly died in 1913. At one stage, Sheila brought, or, or Michael sadly died shortly after delivering the diaries to me. But then his sister said, it's all right, Eric, Michael told me, you've got the diaries. Uh, and let me have them. You can do what you want with them, basically, curate them. Um, but we were five short at that time, covering this 25-year period. However, Sheila found three more, and uh, I was pleased, if that's the right word, because one filled in the war years, 1418, and the, thir the, thir the 13, um, there's, oh, 13 was missing, that's right, um, because his wife had died in that one, so we didn't know... We didn't have the diary at that stage of the year his wife had died. The following year, he says, you know, anniversary of my dear wife. But fortunately, that diary uh, uh, turned up. Um, and then he, he had been a little bit ailing. And his doctor friends would keep coming. Sorry, that's the wrong one. That's the starting one. He was a very meticulous chap, was, 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 was James. And um, this is 1918, and he's been ill and a bit off colour for a while. And Monday the 11th, uh, I'll read, pay gas bill. So he probably booked that in, you know, at the start of the quarter. Pay telephone bill, pay coal bill, whatever. Had a better night. Armistice with Germany signed, and hostilities have ceased from 11 a.m. this morning. Uh, how, how momentous is that? An actual chap living on the day, having heard that, not sure it was wireless or whatever. And then, and his writing's still very legible, very easy to read. Doctors Bannister and Aitken, these are these boozing buddies of his, came today and consulted about my illness and agreed that there were no serious symptoms that could not be rectified with care and strict diet. That's his last entry. He dies 18 day days later. There's no more. So he definitely took a turn for the, for the worse. And but I think that's almost, not a fitting end, but a very momentous entry in, in, in more ways than one. Um, his, his will, when probate was granted, was £83,356, 16 shillings. Now, he trained a son up to be a solicitor, so believe me, if you read the diaries, 
There's all sorts of shares that go into trust and various other things. So that value of 83,000 was probably at least double by the time the shares were uh, handed out to his various family through his solicitor, um, who apparently initially struggled with his exams. So James had to get a tutor to help him so that he passed his law exams and whatever. But he became very useful for uh, various things for the family and the business over time. And in fact, Sheila remembers going to see him uh, has a lovely tale of visiting him in a lovely frock coat and very, very serious looking and put up with the kids and then would clap hands and the kids would be ushered away. Um, another son, while we're talking sons, I'm sort of flicking him out a bit, um, I think it was John, the youngest one. It turned out he wasn't particularly brainy. And either James thought, oh, I don't want him in the company or have enough with three sons anyway. So he came back from the public school where John was, uh, had been sent and told his wife, I think he got back about tea time, and he said, returned from such a school, told mother, we're going to send John to America. Mother was a bit upset. <laughs> so apparently when you gone to see the head, the head said, oh yes, Colonel so-and-so son's a bit, you know, not quite brainy. So we sent him over there to a cattle ranch. We'll do that to John. So that happened to John, he was sent over to America whether he wanted or not, and went uh, cattle farming. Uh, and James put some money out for him so when he got settled he could buy his own um, cattle and farm. But he, got, he had brains as this John, so he married the boss's daughter. <laughs> and then interestingly, when he comes back, from, I think it's the very first time uh, that he's married now, I uh, don't think he had any children, and he comes back with very, very bad toothache, and his teeth are bad, and um, James has to bring a, a sort of dental surgeon in from Liverpool and he complains about the cost that this dental treatment was for his son. About the same time, I think Daniel Thwaites II, the son of the originator of Thwaites Brewery, uh, I was told some time ago by one of the directors there, they come, when they moved from Anum, you know, they demolished the brewery there, there was some old stuff they found in the office and it was the expenses of Daniel Thwaites Jr., or number two, and one of the expenses was, whatever it was, five guineas for removal of golden tooth. So they weren't going to bury Dan with this gold tooth in, they'd jolly well take it out. So there's probably an echo of that with James complaining about the cost of dentistry. At the same time, uh, his daughter-in-law was very, very poorly. I think it sounded something like septicemia. And she very nearly died. And again, it was a case of bringing top surgeons in uh, to look after and it was touch and go. So uh, I often say these diaries is almost a, a middle class Downton Abbey. Believe you me, there's so much in it and it's not all tobacco. Um, you might be aware of Gallagher cigarettes, Gallagher brands, uh, started life in Belfast. He was a personal friend of Mr. Hargreaves. James would go to Liverpool and get the ferry over to Belfast. Mr. Gallagher would send his coach and pair down to take him back. You know, that, that's the level of society he's meeting at the time. And one of the diaries, he's saying he went down to London to meet Mr. Franco. I said, Crikey, that's Hunters and Franco, the biggest cigar importers then in the UK. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Um, another entry says, went out with Mr. Nuttall, he's bought an automobile, multi-car following page, it's Mr. Nuttall of Matthew Brown Brewery. You know, name dropping, <laughs> it's just, a, again, we're back to the worthies of Blackburn, all these businessmen, wealthy businessmen. Blackburn, I don't think, was very much more busy. Forget today, at the time, Blackburn was never more wealthy and profitable. A lot of, mainly Irish people coming in for the mills and the work and this and the other, railways, canals, and of course they wanted their snuff and the cigarettes chewing tobacco the lot. Um, probate, sorry, going back to the will, it, probate's granted to William Ray, Thomas James and Robert, Robert Hargreaves. Um, again, I think we should have, I'll get back to the script, Eric. Um, when his wife died, for some reason, he'd heard about this Anglo-Saxon cross that was preserved inside a church in the 11th century. Uh, I think it was over in Bolton. 
and he went to see the minister, the vicar there, and he liked it so much, he said, am, am I all right to copy that? So he went back with a sculptor. Uh, it's a fantastic cross there. And that was what he had designed for Mary at St. Leonard's, Oswald Destin, at uh, Balderstone, sorry, Balderstones. Uh, I mean, that is quite something, isn't it? You know, you've got your Taj Mahal for your wife, but you know, for a businessman, um, obviously the names are on the bottom there of Mary himself and daughter Jane ends up there as well. But uh, I've been and seen it and it's, wow, you know, not, not a cheap headstone. Um, they eventually moved to Mincing Lane. It was the old central bingo. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to park outside now, would you, on Mincing Lane and uh, whatever street this is. There's the fleet of cars. I, can, I hadn't joined at that stage. Uh, I can, that's Michael Hargreaves, pretty certain that's Derek Renshaw, I think that's Bert Cockshut, I think that's Walt, I'm not sure that Eric Behren's on there as well, the warehouse manager, but uh, uh, as I say, it's the old bingo hall, they eventually moved out, but, sorry, cinema, then we moved out, and they went, turned it into a bingo hall and we moved around the corner in Weir Street. Uh, oh, we're back to those again. Oh, this fella, right. That's when my hair was a different colour. Um, as I say, it was me that sort of saw all these things all over the place and I collected, oh, we've got to save these, we've got to preserve these. There's ashtrays, there's snuff boxes, there's scales, a bit like snuff scales at the top there. Uh, uh, two or three, and I, I actually built a very small boardroom. I built the shelf all around the top to put those on. And the Northern Daily Telegraph, or Lancashire Telegraph as they were then, I think, came and did an article, so I had to sit there. And at the back, there's a little guillotine. That was for cutting the twist. Twist tobacco came like a coiled um, tarred rope almost. You know, you squeezed it, you got the tar on your fingers. Smelt delicious, smelt delicious. And the old boys would slice it with a tobacco knife. And you could tell a chap who smoked tobacco, his thumb would be lacerated all the way down here, where he'd be clipping with this special little sharp... Um, knife, uh, a bit like a tackler's knife. knife. Uh, right. Now, th this was again for publicity. Um, uh, three of the directors Michael Harvey's MD, um, Don Martin. Uh, no tell here, um, normally most of the directors were family. Uh, Don Martin there and myself were non family, so <laughs> we were allowed in. Um, we were the last two directors. I think I've worked out I'm the 16th after James himself. Um, and because we both came on company's house list at the same time, Don's name being Martin was ahead of me, N for Nolan. So I'm claiming, you know, absolutely the last one. Uh, sadly, Don died last year, um, but um, we kept in touch. And in fact, his wife, Jennifer's come over from Lytham today to uh, uh, hear a bit about the history of the company that Don kept us on the straight and narrow monetary wise. And believe you me, when you start talking about tobacco and the cost of tobacco is unbelievable because of the taxation, obviously. And at one stage, Philip Morris wanted to come into the country uh, properly and they would compete against Wills and uh, players, Rothmans, people like that. So they came and they wanted the directors to sign as indemnity if ever we defaulted on a cheque. Now, Normally the chairman could sign the cheques just in his name. If he was away or urgent, either two out of the three of us here could sign the cheques. And it, very occasionally I had to sign them. I normally wouldn't need to. But if Don was on holiday and Michael away, uh, I would have to. And it frightened the life out of me when I was signing a cheque for God knows how many thousand pounds to the Indian Revenue. So when Roger heard that, you know, we be, we personally were to become liable if ever a cheque bounced. He absolutely bristled. He said, this company has never bounced a cheque yet, and it never will, and he refused. So Philip Morris had to come back begging and say, oh, 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 all right, we'll let you off. You know, my word is my bond. Don't need to write anything down. If I say I'll pay you, I'll pay you. And that, that was Mr. Roger. I'm sure that was Mr. James Hargreaves as well. Uh, so there we are. The other guy is Mike Watson. Mike was the buyer who sort of 
got a complete, much better, easier system of ordering. Uh, we then, uh, they bought a company called Cowell Brothers, so that's when the confectionery side came in. All your sweets and lollies and God knows what, aniseed balls. Uh, this is an interesting one, that, uh, an old Wordens, they were still going in Blackburn up there, Wordens Tobacconist, that's, shall we say, the old shops that would be. And the little old one here, which in fact is my mum and dad's little corner shop in Audley Lane. Um, and this side window is interesting. You never put anything in that because players would pay you to do a static display. They put dummy packs in and smoke players please and they'd pay you a little bit of money. So you actually only put your, your, your toffees and whatever in that window. So, so that's Audley Lane and in fact, yes, I found just one invoice to Mrs. Nolan from James Hargis. When I went for my job interview, my company Fieldings, Neville's, had gone bust. I was the bookkeeper cashier, but there's no connection there. <laughs> when I went for the interview, he said, you know, did you buy from Hargreaves? Well, we didn't. We bought from two of the smaller wholesalers in Blackburn, um, John Smith and Mercer's up on Aynham. So I had a very, so, sorry, you know, we didn't use Hargreaves, <laughs> but I still got the job. Uh, this is a bit we mentioned earlier about the value of tobacco. Of course, it was a good one for break-ins at tobacco shops. Uh, there's one on the left there. We're not quite sure whose shop it was, but we certainly know who the fellow that found it all. PC Nolan, PC 53. Worked across the road there. Where are we? Over there, sorry. Uh, so he sorted this lot out. He discovered the <coughs> broken door at the back. And then another one, which actually is from Hargreaves shop in uh, uh, oh, Church Street, the original shop. But look at the last bit. The offence was clearly proved against the prisoner by a youth named Gibson. The bench ordered the prisoner to be whipped and then discharged. Oh dear. The bottom one is somebody buying goods and not paying for them uh, in the Press and Chronicle there. But sign of the times. Now again, we're talking about the police and, and the value. They, well, the police on duty at night would check your door, shop doorways. And uh, when we had Audley Lane shop, we had a dog, a mongrel called Punch, who bark at anything. Uh, but he got to know, well, probably mum kicked, you know, I think he said kicked there, sorry. Scolded him so much, said at half past nine, uh, sorry, ten o'clock, half past ten, policeman will check that door, you don't bark. And he never did. But they would literally come and check your door was, was locked at night. That is um, Williams who at the end of the arcade, Lord Street end, I think it did, yeah. Uh, and in fact, when he closed down, uh, I got his clock, so there's a Ritzler clock in the back there. Similar style to what the Rialto had. Anybody remember the Rialto cinema? And it didn't have letters 1 to 12, it had R, I, A. And there's a boy that impressed me that that Rialto cinema went around the clock. But anyway, uh, I've got a similar one there advertising Ritzler, which was your hand-rolling papers. Uh, anyway, so we moved from uh, Mincing Lane around the corner to an old mill, checking the time here, uh, which originally had been making jacquard looms. And then prior to that, they made carriages apparently. Outside my office, so my office is, 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 is there, there was a, like a big trap door outside. And like, was it Morris Motors made the cars upstairs and they came down on, on a ramp. The carriages did the same apparently. So we, we moved in there. Uh, oh, that's the fellow again. But I'm showing this here only because that's actually Mr. James Hargis's desk. And it had a shelf underneath that came out like this. A bit like your computer things these days. But we're back in, what, 70, 1970. And apparently that was to count the money. James Hargis would count his takings on that tray. Again, Mr. Rogers told me that. So the, you know, sadly that... Not quite sure what happened to that desk. And of course, whenever the press came to do an article, it was a bit like football managers, just pick the phone up and look like you're working, you know. Can you not think of anything? This was the area I, I, I involved in, the Shrek vending machines, some of you might remember. Initially, very, very simple wooden machines. The slightest thing that looked like a half crown would work it. We even had a catering college, not my company, in Salford. And they couldn't work out why packets were disappearing and no money in the little box underneath. Then one day they discovered a damp patch there. 
and the machine was over a radiator, right? All wood. The students were making half crowns from ice and it worked the machine. And then over time and the heat, they melted away. So the evidence melted away. Then we went on the more sophisticated stuff and of course, German stuff, big solid Wurlitzers, 36 columns, my goodness me. So that was the air I did. I also obviously liked old vintage machines, so um, I managed to get that, oh dear, dear, what do they call it, finger here. That one I'm stood up there is a 1920-odd Wittenberg. They didn't make many cigarette machines, they were mainly into drinks. So I rescued that, and then there's some little wood ones there, which would work off a penny or sixpence. Um, Vending basically came in sort of after the war. Shops would have them attached to sort of the gate in front of the, the main shop door so that people could still get the uh, cigarettes at night during closing time. Uh, then they got vandalised a lot, so they sort of went indoors and they'd be an operated service. So we at Sight and Cellar would install a machine, fill it, and pay a commission to the site owner. So I've still got about a dozen vintage cigarette <laughs> machines working up. And there was a column here, I remember. Uh, I think it was Tuttons, and we couldn't work out what on earth Tuttons was for. Normally it was sixpence and a shilling in those days. And again, Mr. Rogers said, Eric, it's boxes of matches. There was a column for selling matches at Tuttons. So we solved that mystery. Um, again, during the time, um, getting a lot of competition from cash and carry, taxation had altered, so you could sell cigarettes at whatever price you wanted. Um, corner shops were undercutting them. As I say, cash and carry is a lot. Uh, we were looking at diversification. We looked at health, pilf firm, decorators, a stationery firm, Betty French, I think it was. Anyway, they discovered the wholesale lot. There was a company in Manchester uh, making these brands, not for Manchester United and the Red and everything. No, no, it was for the United Arab Emirates. So two or three of us companies bought that company and produced our own brand. Uh, to, so we could then control the price of it. And in my vending world, we did the same with a, a, a brand called Markfield. So we produced our own brand so we could sell it and compete. Uh, the general trade were not too pleased, and certainly to the manufacturers. So that's that. And that's a photo shoot from Eric Barron, who is a uh, warehouse manager. And of course, they wanted some glamour. So they'd come and get my girls, who are basically young ladies going out filling machines. It was sort of a three-quarter day job. Uh, so there's um, Chris uh, Willis, Geraldine Eccles, and Hazel Ross smiling at the camera there. Uh, sadly, um, the company was taken over uh, in 1984. Um, Palm and Harvey took us over, a similar national company in distribution of tobacco and sweets. Um, they went bust, I think, about four or five years ago, sadly. But the Hargreaves company was still on their books until about four or five years before they went bust. They just kept the name there, but obviously it was a non-trading company. So, uh, you know, the, the end of a, uh, a story. Um, all started from those diaries. Um, you know, what sort of man was he? Uh, an avid businessman? He worked hard. I know when Roger first started, he was sent to work for a similar firm in Bolton, and he was working practically eight to eight. And then when he got earned his spurs, then he was allowed to come to Blackburn and join the business. Um, again, that went down through the generations. And I remember, I think I'm right, uh, Mr. Roger played rugby for Blackburn Rugby Club, yes. She was nodding. And he got time off on a Saturday afternoon to play his game. As soon as you shout, he'd to go back in the shop because they'd stay up until about six or eight o'clock at night on a Saturday. Um, when he came to his father's deathbed, first thing his father said, Thomas, who's looking after its shop? <laughs> so, so that's the era, you know. Now. But he, he, he was wonderful in his, I think a lot about mill owners, you might call them, yes, they made money, but they would often want to put some of that money back into the community. Uh, Roger was, sorry, James Hargis was something like that. He's selling his hunter horses for £50 to the army for World War I and checking horses, telling his sons off, come on, sell one of your horses to the army. You know, they, they, they need the horses for the, uh, for the fight. So that's the sort of man he was. And loved the theatre. As I say, right down there would lend 
Blackburn Drama Club, the time I'm a member of, a free van to move our scenery and to be a company patron. So that went right the way down as well. Um, so uh, that's sort of not quite the end of the story. As I say, the Arts Society have digitalised all this. What a lot of us would really like to do is to publish these. They're literally, and there is so much in it, as I said, and not just about tobacco. Um, whether we go there or not, I'm certainly going to apply for grants. Uh, we have printed out at the back, available, a few copies of the preface that I wrote for these diaries, uh, an actual uh, a foreword from uh, Sheila, Sheila Watley, and then notes for the readers from Ian Holland, who sort of with me, uh, you know, the two of us, um, sorted out the transcription. So if you want to pick any of those up, they're very interesting as well. Certainly Ian's notes at the end, you know, you're very professional level as far as Blackburn in those times and what's happening in the world. Um, but as I say, we, we would like to see if we could um, print these diaries or, or even have another series, you know, like Downton Abbey, uh, James Hargreaves uh, series on TV. Yeah, I'm, I'm still looking at that. I have a BBC producer who's nibbling a bit, but there we are. So thanks for coming. Uh, there's, a, as you say, a display at the back. Last night before I sort of signed off, uh, uh, Asian uh, curator, uh, security guy came in and he's walking along and says, Oh, my dad smoked that. Uh, there was another one, uh, cat, cat, black cat, that's what. And I couldn't get away, he was going along. Uh, so I'm sure I, I, maybe some of you are a bit like that today, walking along saying, oh, that's the wild woodbine I had behind the bike sheds at school, you know, and things like that. So I nearly said, hands up those who smoke, but no, I'll not put you on the spot. But thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for Mary. I'm glad so many came after all this time and uh, hope you found it. Uh, successful, Mary. Thank you. Thank you.